Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Brenda Clement, Executive Director of Citizens Housing and Planning Association, a nonprofit umbrella organization for affordable housing and community development activities in Massachusetts. Brenda has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Brenda, for joining thank us today. Thank you for the opportunity. Affordable housing is such a big topic across the nation as the, uh, as the economic uh, circumstances of people shift. Mm -hmm. We have people who previously were doing okay, now being thrown into homelessness. Talk about the impetus for the founding of the uh, Citizens Housing and Planning Association in 67 mm -hmm. and how that founding still has relevance today. Sadly, it does. Um, the, a group of folks, uh, concerned citizens, as the name uh, suggests, came together because they were concerned about housing and homelessness in their community, but they were also s concerned about the lack of support at local levels to build affordable housing. The reality is that we all need affordable housing. It, it, uh, it's a factor of your income. Uh, the federal government has a definition for it, but it, no matter what, if you even if you earn a million dollars a week, if all the housing are, is two million dollars a week, it's still unaffordable for you. Obviously, we're not talking about that level of housing. So it's a basic common need that everybody needs to keep a safe roof over their head. And it was true in 1967 when Chapa and, and many concerned citizens came together. And sadly, it's still true today here in 2013 in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and across the country. And what is affordable today, if, particularly if you're living on a fixed income, or if you are, are sustaining at a particular level, mm -hmm. what's affordable today will not remain affordable today because housing stocks shift. And, and they're not shifting down. That's they're, right. They're, they're shifting up and sometimes considerably higher. Considerably higher, especially in markets like Boston that are recovering pretty quickly, or at least parts of Boston are recovering pretty quickly from the economic downturn that we've all experienced over the last couple of years. And the gap between what people can afford and what the housing costs are continue to grow and grow at an alarming rate. Our homelessness numbers are back up in a big time way in Massachusetts again, despite the fact that this is a state that, that invests quite a bit of funding and money from their state resources in affordable housing. The gap continues to grow. Now, let's take the, the, the uh, devil's advocate position. Mm -hmm. What happens if housing stocks are not affordable to people? What actually happens to families? What actually happens to communities? Well, the fact is that workers who need, that communities need in order to make their community thrive can't live in or near their community. Workers such as? Workers such as teachers, workers such as firefighters, workers such as retail workers, everybody who takes care of our children at child care facilities and everybody who takes care of our grandparents at nursing homes or assisted living facilities are priced out of the market in many communities here in this state and in many communities across the country. So the need to provide for our workforce is a critical need. Need, and we got that years and years ago in this area. Uh, when you go through all the old mill towns in this community, in these areas, we you see all around the mills various types of housing for workers. So we understood that connectedness at some point in time in our history, but we've lost it, and we need to restitch that back in and restitch that acceptance to, of housing back into communities. Not to mention the elderly or or young people who mm -hmm. suddenly are starting families and find right. themselves shifted out of out of neighborhoods. That's right. And and in order for a community to thrive and to grow, we need to continue to have an a and a, a wide variety of housing choices for those people. And we need starter homes, we need starter rental homes, and we need starter homes uh, for, or, for pe or homes for people to downsize to as well, too. So it's an ongoing need, it's an ongoing challenge. The need changes as, as the demand changes as well, too. But communities need to be willing to embrace that as well, too. And unfortunately for us in the affordable housing world, you know, we have lots of stigmas that get attached to what affordable housing is. But affordable housing really is for workforce and for housing for workers who are needed to make a community thrive. Talk about Citizens Housing's uh, approach to, mm -hmm. to addressing these issues. Well, CHAP, uh, Citizens Housing Planning, or CHAPA, as it's commonly known here, as you, as you know, as you said, is a, a long-term organization here. And it's the big tent, or the big umbrella, in which all of the various housing players come together. So our membership and board is made up of realtors, bankers, um, real estate advocates, uh, uh, local advocates, planners, um, homeless providers, 
CDCs, Community Development Corporations, kind of anybody and everyone who works in the affordable housing arena. So these are business people writ large. They're yep. business people who are in the business of advocacy. They're people who are in the business of providing local services to people who have limited means right. or the business of financing uh, real estate development. This That's is right. th this That's is a group of professionals who are right. coming together to solve a real problem. That's right, and it, and it, but it also includes some local uh, concerned citizens and advocates and other mm -hmm. other individuals. But for a, a long time back, the founders of Chapa realized that we needed that that big table where all the right. parties came together. Uh, and for that reason, CHAP is a fairly unique advocacy organization that we try to be the full spectrum of issues um, and this, a full spectrum of players concerned about the issue. So and we try to come to consensus around you know, what our approaches should be. And there are people with different ideas, different interests, mm -hmm. different backgrounds, yep. and they're bringing their ideas to the table and they're dealing with each other. Yep. There's a communication yep. issue here. There is a knowledge transfer that's right. uh, issue here? That's right, and it's a very impressive organization. I'm a relatively new executive director to CHAP. I've been there just a little bit over a year and a half now, uh, having run a previous uh, type of organization mm -hmm. in Rhode Island, a little bit smaller, obviously, on this, uh, with uh, anything in Rhode Island, it's smaller. Um, but it's, uh, I'm finding it fascinating to be able to bring together this wide, diverse group of people who have yet a common interest and are willing to sit at the table with people who they might agree with, disagree with at the previous meeting, but come together to find some commonality around an issue that they care about. And it's um, an extremely impressive uh, group of people. We have a 50 plus member board, uh, so it's taken me a, a while to, to uh, get to know lots of all of the folks on the board too, but um, they really have um, provided great insight and leadership and, and care more important, most importantly about the issue and about making sure that everybody in the state has a safe place to lay their head at night. And for that passion, you know, it's just been a delight to be able to work with them. What type of solutions does does Chapa uh, develop mm -hmm. with, with with these constituents? Well, obviously, money and resources. Um, and I, you know, Massachusetts is a state that puts their money where their mouth is in terms of this issue, and and have put uh, a huge amount of resources in both the state budget. The legislature just passed a 1.4 billion dollar bond issue for capital dollars to build and develop affordable housing. That level of commitment is just not seen in many other states. Um, in, in including some of the bigger states, and so but this, that's impressive. But this commitment is not only a government commitment. It's not only a government commitment. The um, private investors and um, CHAPA has tools like uh, a law called 40B that is essentially an inclusionary zoning tool that encourages for-profit developers to set aside a, a percentage of their units as affordable in order to go through this expedited appeal process at the local level. And so there are tools like zoning tools, like planning tools, and money and resources in order uh, to be able to address the issue and the problem. So there are, are incentives for businesses to invest in this way and to right. cooperate with other players. Right, and I, and I think that broad table helps us a lot uh, in, ident in identifying resources because it's not just kind of the typical suspects, if you will, about law, uh, affordable housing advocates and, and providers going to the group. It's, it's a realtor, it's a business, uh, it's a developer, it's a, uh, a, a local a tax attorney and other people who work in the industry and the field who are also our advocates when we go to the state legislature or go to the governor's office. And that's an effective message and that's an effective coalition. When these issues are brought to you, who, who does the bringing of the issues? Is it, w will it be a, um, a community or a community advocate? Will mm -hmm. it be a business person who would like to develop but, but sees impediments? Mm -hmm. how, how does this actually? It comes through all methods. Uh, CHAPA has a very extensive committee structure and committee uh, working group structure as well too and so a lot of the idea, ideas are generated from that. We also are in regular touch with our our membership base of uh, about a thousand plus members and so we in fact we're just embarking on our regional meetings across the state where we deliberately go out and ask people you know what's what's the current problem and issue in your community and how do we address it and how do we work forward with it so it comes from both the bottom up some of it is staff ideas obviously but a lot of it comes from our, our membership base and our constituency base. What are your strongest successes over the last years? Well, certainly the, the law that I mentioned, and this was prior to me coming, but I worked on it um, from my role in Rhode Island at the time, 
uh, defending uh, successfully uh, a ballot initiative that would have eliminated the 40B law that I just mentioned, which is our our local planning tool to help us build and develop affordable housing, particularly particularly in suburban communities. Um, uh, folks who don't particularly like affordable housing were successful a couple of years back in getting a ballot question on the statewide ballot that would have essentially defeated or, or um, turned back that law um, in many significant ways. Uh, CHAPA spearheaded an effort in a campaign to beat that back and the vote no on two campaign vote no was actually a yes vote <laughs> for yeah. affordable housing so that was a tricky campaign to manage but my predecessor did a masterful job of uh, of, pa of defeating that ballot initiative and um, and getting uh, broad support for the the, uh, the act moving forward so and that's continued to help us these last couple of years in the legislature um, obviously the 1.4 billion dollar bond bill is something that we're very proud of it's uh, currently in conference committee and we're hoping that it's going to get reported out over the next day or two but it shows a huge and significant commitment um, to um, to the issue from the mass legislature and the governor's office and we're also very proud of a supportive housing commission um, that we were successful in establishing which brings together all of the state agencies who impact services in particular for people who are in need of supportive housing and trying to coordinate um, the uh, state housing department also as part of that whole effort put together a, um, a thousand vouchers um, to tie into the supportive housing work of those agencies as well too so all of those things you know are, are parts of the tools in the tool belt and that help us address the ongoing challenges of homelessness and housing uh, challenges for people. Because these people generally are underrepresented. They don't have mm -hmm. uh, any economic means or many economic no. means. Um, they uh, very frequently don't vote. Right. Uh, they frequently they don't have an address. They don't have an address. So, that, so it's difficult to, to even participate in a, right. in, in a civic sense. That's right. Uh, so they, they have a voice, but that voice isn't heard. And, mm -hmm. and you actually help to ensure that that voice and those needs are taken into account. Well, me and a whole lot of other people, obviously. And we have a great staff and, as, as I already mentioned, the great board at CHAPA that I rely on greatly as well, too. But yes, I mean, we... We want to be the, that voice. We want to make sure that all interests of the housing spectrum are represented at the table. We do a lot of our homelessness advocacy work through a coalition that we staff called Building Blocks Coalition. And we really do believe strongly, obviously, as housing advocates, that housing and a good, safe place to lay your head at night is the foundation or the building blocks that people need in order to get the rest of their life in order. Um, I, my organization in Rhode Island, our motto was that the path to economic opportunity begins at your front door. And I think that's true uh, no matter where you go up from every day, either to a job or to school or to a training program. If you don't have that front door to go out of every morning, everything is just so much harder. How, how many staff do you have at, at CHAPA? CHAPA has um, 14 staff people, okay. um, a mixture of both part-time and full-time uh, folks as well too. And we run a number of programs in addition to our advocacy work. And you've done research as well? Uh, we do a lot of research and kind of uh, white papers and policy papers and reports on a number of different topics. We do a lot of the tracking around the success of the 40B law and also um, on uh, impact of homelessness, but also looking at the economic impact of housing as well too on the local community. How do you recruit your board members to ensure that, that you have a balanced board that is also represented, because in, in these types of organizations you need to have certain competencies from a governance perspective. Right. You also need to have a certain, uh, to ensure that certain voices are represented. Right. Um, well, the interesting thing is that, at least in my uh, experience here at CHAPA, is that recruiting people for the board isn't the problem. Uh, getting, uh, telling people no is, uh, because we have a lot of people who are interested in being on the board. And so, but you're absolutely right, we want to, you know, keep the balance of the various interests. So, um, we have not found recruitment to be a, a problem on the board. One of the, our challenges, though, is to try how to incorporate more younger professionals into the work, especially mm -hmm. as our board ages. Um, and the, our, their expertise is still very valuable, but we also want to bring in some new fresh ideas and new innovative ways. So trying to keep, so our, our struggle more this last year has been trying to um, figure out a way to keep 
the value and to keep the expertise of our board folks, but to move them into a different forum so that we can open up some seats um, for younger or different voices as well, too. And it's a challenge that I think a lot of other nonprofits are facing as well, too. But um, there's it, so finding people is not the problem, figuring out what the right mix continues to be. And your funding streams, how does that work? Um, we're a typical nonprofit. We have, you know, 10 to 12 different funding streams as the executive director. I spend a lot of time fundraising as, as do most executive directors. We have some programmatic dollars um, in uh, for some 40B monitoring work and some other work that we do around a mass access program, which is a database and housing program for people with disabilities. Um, so some of that program dollars uh, fund that. We also- So that's a fee for service. That's You're a fee for service. Um, we also have a run a housing counseling at the Mass Housing um, okay. Homeownership Collaborative, which coordinates all of the home buyer education and counseling programs. We administer a couple of federal HUD, uh, HUD grants, including uh, a New England wide one for federal um, for housing counseling. Uh, we run a, a related organization called the New England Housing Network, which uh, brings together all of our colleagues throughout New England, uh, particularly around federal policy and advocacy work as well, too. Um, and so it's a mixture of different things. We have very strong support from our local United Way and our local community foundation, Boston Foundation. Uh, we obviously have a fairly substantial membership base, um, which helps. We have a big event coming up in a couple of weeks, our annual dinner that attracts um, well over a thousand people to it. And so that it becomes an important signature event and fundraising event as well too. But it's a mixture of, you know, you're constantly writing grants, uh, constantly looking for opportunities to expand our programs. And you are also involved in both urban and rural areas right, as well. Right, right. Urban, suburban, and rural. I mean, Massachusetts right. has a little bit of everything, obviously. Yes. We are a statewide organization, so we try to work and address all of the issues. How, how do the issues differ? Aside from the obvious, you're, you're dealing <laughs> with uh, urban environments, very, very built environments. Right. Uh, suburban areas, you've got some other issues and mm -hmm. rural areas you're not dealing with built environments right but but how do uh, how do you adjust your programs for those different environments well um, it's it depends on what we're offering to the community but I mean the difference is that on a, while the needs are obviously different we have to talk about use our terminology different when we're talking about multifamily in a, or building multifamily rental that means something very different in an urban environment right. than it does in a rural environment. The other difference between a lot of those communities is that while the more urban and usually the suburban communities have planning staff or have other resources at the town level, that is not true in many of the smaller cities and towns in Massachusetts, as many <laughs> smaller cities and towns as well too. And so we have to um, try to be more s supportive uh, or provide more direct technical assistance and resources to those small towns that just don't have the capacity to do things. So it, it, that's a hard question to answer because it really depends on what they need or want from us as well too, but it's trying to shape the tools uh, and provide enough flexibility in the tools that we create, whether it be funding or zoning or whatever, so that it can be adapted to that local community. Today it seems so much as hyper-partisan mm -hmm. when it when it really shouldn't be. It didn't right. used to be like this. No. And when you're working on a statewide basis, there will be uh, counties, there will be areas that are both uh, very liberal and very conservative. Right. How does that play into your work? Um, I think that, again, we try not to let it play into our work. We try to keep our message bipartisan, if you will, or broad enough to show that we're talking about people who live and work in your community now. We're talking about providing for people who are already there and making sure that they have a safe, decent place to lay their head at night. So, so you're focusing on solutions as opposed to some... Um, a partisan approach or winners or losers or any of that. It's, it's really about your community. That's right. We're trying to help that community be a stronger community and use the tools at our disposal to help them do that and, and to abide by fair housing laws and to abide by other things that they're required to do as well too, but making it clear to them and, pro and providing them the information and the tools to show these are folks who are already here in your community. These are folks who want to stay in your community and want to downsize from their two acre house that, you know, that now that they're 75 can no longer maintain any longer, but want to stay in the community that they've always lived in. And so we want to help you provide those housing options and choices that make sense. Is homelessness uh, and, and housing issues, are those solvable problems or are these problems that really have to be managed uh, by groups like, like yours and others? 
I think they're very sol solvable problems. I mean, the, while the numbers are, ten are growing, they tend to still be manageable in, in areas like, like Massachusetts and New England and other places. And it's a matter of political will and local support uh, to allow the development to happen that we need to shift around. Like I said, uh, we, we have image issues as affordable housing. I, I, I need a new cultural reference, but I always say that housing is the Rodney Dangerfield of issues, despite the fact that you know all of us agree on one level that it's something that we need, um, that we all need. Communities continue to still resist it just because they have misconceptions about what it can look like in their community. So part of our role as advocates is to change and to clarify those misconceptions. To educate and dare I say market yeah. what what this show them, actually right show means. them what this means and show them you know how they can even at a small town level to a big urban neighborhood how they can make this fit and make this work in their community. The other important thing for affordable housing advocates is that this is stuff that's going to be around for a while. So we as community residents in our own community want to make sure that it's something that's an asset to the community and not a detriment to the community because it's going to be there affordable for at least 30 years depending yes. on the funding source or much, much longer um, depending on what type of housing gets built. And so it needs to be something that's a community asset and not a neg negative feature in that community. And we care about what it looks like and who's in it and how it's managed. And I think we've got many great examples in the state. I know we have many great examples in the state of how to do it right. So important for healthy communities. Brenda Clement, thank you so much you. for sharing your experience with us. Thank and you. thank you for your insights. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks.